And hello, everybody. Welcome to Elijah Soma Ministries. Uh, it is Friday night. I got it right this time. And it's 7 p.m. up here on Freedom Mountain. It's a beautiful Friday evening. Uh, actually, the humidity has slowly disappeared. And it's crystal clear outside. And uh, it's Labor Day weekend. So if you hear motorcycles going by, Yes, our road gets extremely busy on the holidays. People from the city are coming up trying to escape the uh, anxieties of this world, and um, I can't blame them. So you might hear some noise. I'm hoping that they don't start for a little bit, but either way, I praise the Lord that they can have a place to escape to like, like our area. Uh, we have services Sunday morning at 10 about 10.45 will be Facebook Live. We normally start our church itself at 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, that's Sunday morning. And then Tuesday evening at 7, I have a, a Facebook Live. And Wednesday night at 7, uh, Dr. Pegg will be doing her Facebook Live. So I'm just excited that um, all of you are starting to come on. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Margie. Good to see you all again. Uh, it is a beautiful evening out there. And I'll try to keep this short and sweet because I think some of you probably want to get out and take a walk and enjoy your evening. It, it is getting dark earlier and earlier now. So I just uh, I want to thank the Lord for all he's doing in the lives of the people at our church, people they are connected to. Uh, again, I want to challenge the church, not, not my church alone, the church, that we need to we need to respect each other's views. And we need to remember, they'll know us by the love that we have for one another. So, I like. hopefully I'm going to finish uh, the series of sermons that I've had the last two times. This will be part three of, Is There Evidence of Christ in Your Life? So, I've, I've enjoyed talking about it. I've had a lot of good comments. And you know what was exciting? On last Tuesday, a few people uh, jumped in that I hadn't heard from in a long time. And there were there was one in particular, a gentleman that was at the ministry with us previously uh, about 25, 26 years ago. He and his wife have dual citizenship in India, here in India, I'm sorry, here in America and in India. And they've started a wonderful orphanage and Christian school and actually like a Votech area at their um, at the orphanage that they that they built. And we had been their prayer partners for years. And we always enjoyed working with them at the other ministry. His wife actually was one of the school teachers uh, under um, Dr. Pegg and Miss Margie, who were the principals and the vice principal of this Christian school. I got to co-teach with uh, his with David's wife. It was it was a blast. Uh, loved hearing about the Indian culture and just getting to know you know people from other countries and and just how things are different over there yet how some of them are so so much the same and you know they're a perfect example of the evidence of Christ in their life and in their family's lives so I just I don't know if Dave's gonna be on today but I just it was exciting to see him on hi Juwan good to see you uh, I just Again, I'm excited that those of you that are watching, please hit your share button. That way, that way other people can see it on the timeline and maybe they'll jump in and, and uh, start to watch. So anyway, let me get started. I'm not going to review all the other times I've, I've already reviewed. I think I'll just, I'm going to start, is there evidence of Christ in your life? It's pretty self-explanatory. I had mentioned before, if you claim to be a carpenter, you have to show evidence that you really are. You can't just say, hey, I'm a carpenter. You know, if you're a computer genius, well, you have to prove that you're a computer genius by your work. And is there the evidence of Christ in your life by the fruits of the Spirit? So I want today, tonight, I want you to think about your story. What is your story? And, and over the last oh, 10 years, we've had in our church services, we've taken time to have people just randomly come up. We Pastor Tim would call them up and say. Tell us your story, and, and yeah, so put people on the spot, but you know, we all should have a story that we can share. So when has God proved faithful to you? When has he proved faithful? And, you know, you look back and, you know, you'll say, oh, God gave me this, God gave me that. But were there times faithfulness wasn't about getting stuff? 
but faithfulness could have been about feeling the peace of God when everything around you seems to be falling apart and people see Christ in you I remember seven or eight years back I don't my as I get older the days and years seem to be a little further pretty far between it's hard to remember exactly but a few years ago my sister passed away but unexpectedly she passed away at 53 and uh, it was it was a shock never expected it and I was probably 48 or 49 at the time and what was so strange was talking to her on the phone that morning she passed away she sounded very normal we joked around just like we always did and she was in San Antonio Texas and I was um, I was up here and we were just talking away and she was in the hospital and said she'd be getting out that evening and everything seemed to be okay she just felt a little weird and then following five six hours later my other sister called and said she uh, had heard something strange on the phone when she was talking to a nurse where my sister was and all of a sudden uh, she got a call or she called again and she said Rob I have to hang up and she hung up she called me back in a few minutes and the strange sound that she had heard is over the intercom when she was talking to the nurse she had heard a cold blue in um, my sister's in my sister's room that she was in and she had passed away and it was a and so when my sis, other sister told me that on the phone I was devastated uh, I was I was I was in shock um, there's no easy way of saying it wasn't easy but but I knew she had a relationship with the Lord because over the last 10 years before that I began to see the evidence of Christ in her life again when years before that there was a lot of pain and agony in her life and you didn't see a lot of fruit of the Spirit but in the 10 years before she passed away she she really began to show the evidence of Christ in her life and that gave me peace to be able to fly back to to Washington State actually to um, to do a memorial service for for the for my family for her and uh, and to be able to survive it and that, that was a challenge but you know the evidence of Christ in her life allowed me to give the testimony of how God delivered her and set her free so what has he done to show you that your faith is not in vain what has he done in your life I want you to ask yourself that write it down on a piece of paper write your story how God has proved himself faithful to you have you ever taken on a mission that God with uh, so big and I talked about this before so big that you know oh man and you know I look back and when I ask that question have you ever taken a mission on or something on that seemed so big and it's interesting when you take the small things on it's not that dramatic but when it's a big thing wow and one, you know, one big, well, there's been lots of big things in Peggy and I's life. Uh, the first big thing was selling our house, our car, and everything in Walla Walla, Washington, and moving to Pennsylvania in the middle of February. That was a God thing. That's all I can say. It was a God thing. And, you know, being uh, Christian school teachers for two years in southern Pennsylvania, you know, God provided in miraculous ways. He was faithful. And then moving to Christ's home for children for seven and a half years. That was, that was powerful. God taught us faith. And he, bore, he showed us, he showed faithfulness to us all the time. It, it, was, it was just, I mean, everything from allowing us to adopt Charlotte, blessing us when we did, um, and then Philip, and then getting a little Marquita into our house. Marquita was our goddaughter that the grandmother wanted us to raise. She was 18 months old and she lived with us until she was about, I want to say, 9 or 10. Uh, she was just, just a little sweetheart. And God just continued to bless us. And, and when, we need, when we needed finances, God took care of that. And we didn't have to go begging people for money or anything. God just, it, it happened. And we were just listeners and we were obedient. And so... God proved faithful in our life and 
And then there were some other big things. As God began to enlarge the ministry up here, for example, even getting this farm. You know, God gave us this farm in a miraculous way. And if you need, if you want to hear more stories about that, you can you can contact us and we can send you a book called Reflections that we wrote about the ministry and how God brought us up here. And, you know, I just, I look back when we built the pavilion over here and I shared a little bit about that before. Uh, the pavilion came after our barn burned down and we outgrew our house church. We were getting kind of cramped in the summertime, so we started having outside services at our pavilion. And then we, then when my son um, Dorian passed away, uh, some of the finances came in that we were able to start enclosing that pavilion, and that's what it was—a pavilion. You look at it now, you just, oh, it's, it's such a beautiful little church on the inside, and and then how God told us to to build phase two, that was two hundred sixty-nine thousand dollars. That was a big, big thing. That was a big thing, and when we were building the first the the pavilion itself. I had just crushed my hand, and so I wasn't able to help very much other than supervise or supervise, whatever you want to call it. But everybody pitched in, the whole church. And, and it's interesting, when you have a big project, a big job, and, and God proves faithful, which he always does, people begin to react. The challenging thing is when you don't have a physical big job going on, but you have a big spiritual job going on like this pandemic. And a lot of people don't look at it the same way. And a lot of people just kind of cower down, hide inside their houses. Um, they don't communicate hardly at all with anybody. And they just, they're afraid of everything. And I'm, I'm not talking about anybody in particular. But I see this throughout the country. People are scared. And they don't need to be. And we need to, we need to say, you know, God is faithful. Um... Having gone through so many experiences up here in the Northeast, it's strengthened my faith personally. But it's going through them, not stopping and falling on your face and laying on your face and never getting up. Every time, It's not how many times you fall down, it's how many times you get up. It's how God grows you up. So what has God done in your life to prove he is faithful and trustworthy? Is, is the fear of trusting God keeping you from seeing his power in your life? See, a lot of people have trust issues. And, you know, they might have trust issues with other human beings. And it just pour, it just spills on to God. They don't trust God. I know one thing that I, as, I, as a pastor I've come to, to understand, that often when we say Father God or Father this, and we're referring to a, a close relationship with the Lord, there are people out there that were abused by their fathers. And so every time they hear father, they get all worried and, and they get all upset about it. And they don't have a good relationship with their heaven, their worldly father. So they try to bring that relationship into the relationship with God. And so I've come to a point that I, I remind people, God is the perfect father. He doesn't abuse. He doesn't kill, steal, or destroy. He doesn't make people sick. And, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't call you stupid. He doesn't tell you that you're worthless. It's the other way around. So remember that. that. God just loves you so much. So let me encourage you to trust him. Nothing else makes sense. <laughs> if nothing else makes sense, trust him. He is trustworthy. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You've got to have faith in who he is. So I ask you again, what evidence would be brought against you to prove that you have faith in God? Would it be so clear that you would indeed be convicted of being a follower of Christ? Or would they say, oh, you're the follower of that bartender, or you're the follower of that, that football team, or you're a follower, oh, I know you more for sports, or I know you more for, I don't know Christ, you, you're a Christian. Now, has anybody ever asked you that? Do people have to ask you if you're a Christian? Man, I know about you, that, that would scare me. Hi, Heidi, it's good to see you. Um, other people jumping on right now, that's great. It's great to see you guys. Um, Mike Anderson, great to see you. Uh, there's so many people coming on it. And, but again, I, I want to get back to what I was saying. Is there evidence to prove who you are a Christian? Or do people have to ask you if you're a Christian? Evidence of purity. The last thing Paul mentions to young Timothy is that his life should be an example of, Christ, of a Christian throughout the purity of of his lifestyle. 
And, and that's people say, well, what do you mean by that? People watch you to see how you react and how you act. If this, if this was true in their day, how much more is it for ours? Living a pure life by biblical standards is not only considered impossible, but totally out of step with today's progressive culture. We are bombarded with all kinds of media telling us in thousands of ways that sexual freedom, homosexual lifestyles, same-sex marriages are not only acceptable, but applauded. See, that's not what the Bible says. Purity of life also includes a life of integrity, of honesty, of simply always doing the right thing regardless of the cost. And see, that's the challenge today. Politicians will do the right thing according to what works for them, not according to what uh, the Bible says. And that goes on both sides of the, 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 you know, Republicans and Democrats, independents. Many of them, not all, but many will do whatever it takes to get get elected and they'll lie or they'll they'll change they'll ch they say they well I've changed my point of view well no you knew they were going to lie so that purity needs to go in be even into financial dealings business practice I know so many Christians that that they say that their Christianity Christianity is not part of their business and that's wrong but on the other hand I know other Christians that that you can see Christ in that business. I remember many years ago when uh, I taught Christian school back in York, near York, Pennsylvania. Uh, during the summertime, I worked for a contractor. And I was more of a gopher. I really wasn't much of a construction guy. And I remember so often, people knew that my boss was a Christian. In fact, he was an elder, elder at our church. He was also on the board of our church a rather large church in that area at that time. And when they had, they knew, number one, he would do everything possible. He, how can I say this? He always, his integrity level was at the highest. And there, I remember one time, one of the ladies that we were doing some work for, I think we were putting a roof on her house. She said, oh, I have to go to the doctor and get some tests. And, and my boss yelled for us to come down off the roof. He said, can we pray for you? And she goes, oh, I would love that. And so here we stopped what we were doing, and we prayed for God to heal her. So, you know, there was evidence of Christ in my boss's life everywhere, everywhere. He's also the man that about two, maybe, I think two years, three years ago, uh, he actually fell off a roof and, and landed on his head. And the doctors gave him less than 5 to 10% of survival rate. And he is now back, um, I would say probably 90, 95% back to normal. He still has some memory problems once in a while, but he's doing really good. You know, so yes, Christians come under attack, but I'll tell you what, God is faithful. How about look at, you know, if you look at the scriptures, if you look at Daniel chapter 6, you know, re remember, go back to Daniel and, you know, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, some of the things that they went through. Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 4, said, <clears throat> excuse me, and it talks about some of the jealousy with, within the group that um, Daniel was part of. His jealous co-workers were determined to defame him and, and get him killed. They looked high and low at every aspect of his life. You remember that in Daniel chapter 6? Those guys did everything they could to try to defame him. He looked high and low in every aspect of his life, but here's what we read in Daniel 6, 4 to 5. Daniel 6, verses 4 to 5 says they could, they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it is something to do with the law of his God. So Daniel's purity of life was so evident that his accusers could find nothing corrupt or even negligent in the way he lived. And remember, he was living in another country at the time under another king. Uh, let's say, or the way he lived or the way he did business and the way he dealt with other people. He was always had pure motives and never cheated anybody. Imagine that every stone in your life was overturned. Let me ask you that. If somebody went and they, they overturned every part of your life, 
your finances were exposed, your business dealings were scrutinized, would they be able to find any impurity, any evidence that you were not squeaky clean? I bet both, all of us would admit none of us are squeaky clean. Would they have to conclude, as they did with Daniel, that you're never going to do anything that is against the God you serve, and therefore you are truly a Christian? See, that's that's the challenge. Are we, are we like Daniel, or are we like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said, you know what, King, you know, you you guys say I'm supposed to bow down, but I will not bow down to anybody. I will not worship anybody other than my God. And when they said, well, he goes, I'm just going to throw you into the fire. He said, go ahead. If you throw us into the fire, O king, and they even respected the king as they spoke to him. If you throw us into the fire, and we believe our God will save us, but even if he doesn't, we will worship no other God. And of course, we know that they were saved and set free, and boy, the king was excited. So what about you? If some, you know, and in this day and age, like if you ever run for politics, they'll dig up every little bit of dirt. You better... You better repent in public before they before they find out it about you, or they'll make something up. They did that today on the news. Uh, anonymous. I love it when I love anonymous. Anonymous wrote in this news article that the president had said something that he hadn't said. All the people that had been there said no, he never said that. But somebody named anonymous. When uh, when we had. Uh, Godchildren living at our house, uh, this one teenage boy, he'd always say, we'd say, well, who did it? He would say, nobody. So finally we came to realize nobody was like his second friend. He'd always blame nobody, which was actually somebody. And it's just interesting when people write in anonymous, that is just such a joke. Number one, God always reveals the truth sooner or later. But if you don't have the guts enough and the fortitude to, to share what you really feel and put your name to it, don't share it. Nobody respects the anonymous when it comes to attacks on different people. I just had to share that. But I just thought, oh man, they did that to the president and all these people around him. And they said something that was, they were, he, they were trying to destroy um, his reputation and his integrity, like they did with Daniel. Remember, you know, it was said that he was supposed to bow down and he was not to worship anybody but the king, and they caught him worshiping God. And, you know, they tried to nail him to the cross for that. So anyway, here's an interesting poem I found. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. People read what you write, distort or true. What is the gospel according to you? Something to think about, isn't it? What kind of gospel are you writing in front of people? Remember, people who don't know Jesus don't typically read the Bible. But they read the people who read the Bible. Yeah, they read us. They do. We are a living letter before man. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, You know that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. We are God, we are God's word, his truth to a world in desperate need of Jesus. Wow. And I think one actually says we are uh what is it? You know, like when you when you go to get um a reference, we are a written reference. God you know, God has written us, we are his actual reference of who God is. That's pretty crazy. Well, I think another Another translation or another scripture actually says we are like uh, diplomats, you know, for God. So what is the message written on your heart? The evidence in your life which others can see and read and readily know that you are a Christian, that you follow Christ. What's the evidence? Is there any? Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Hmm. I love this thought. Commitment no matter what. And you know, a lot of times by, the, by your actual actions, that will show who you really are. Here's a great story I found. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful story I'd like to share with you. It's, uh, it's um, let's see, a young woman uh, who, out of curiosity, entered a little Presbyterian church one evening. She heard the gospel for the first time and was converted. 
Later, she heard God's call on her life to go to China as a missionary. She was the only daughter of a multi-millionaire. She was socially prominent and wealthy, but her parents were not Christians. When she told them of her decision to go to the mission field, they sneered at the very idea. They were sure they could quickly put a stop to her passing, this passing whim. The girl was engaged to a successful businessman who was also not a Christian. When she approached him about surrendering his life to the Lord, he took a stand similar to his parents. Some time later, her parents gave a social function to which they invited their socially prominent wealthy friends. Their parents told these friends about their problem and or her parents told these friends about their problem and asked them to help change their daughter's mind. That evening, the daughter listened in silence to the discouraging pleas of everyone at the party. She stood up, went to the piano, and began to play, or began playing and singing, Jesus, um, I my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee, destitute, despised, and forsaken, thou for hence my all shall be. Her fiancé was so deeply touched by her commitment, he walked over to her and said, I did not know Jesus Christ could mean that much to any person. If he means that to you, please pray that I can become his follower too. Her prayer was answered. They were married and both went to China where they labored for the Lord many years. That's pretty cool. So commitment. Hmm. Of course, I recognize that none of us are likely to be on trial anytime soon. At least not in this country. But who knows because we're seeing churches being locked down and told not to, to actually um, open up. You know, we might not be attacked for our faith, but they'll figure out something else. However, there's much, we need to remember more than anything. There's a higher court that's above the Supreme Court. Of course, that is the court when we stand before the Lord. We will stand before the Lord and give evidence of what we did here on this earth in his name. Will your faith stand up in that court? Will you, you know, will God say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or will he say, I knew you not? I don't know. Would there be enough evidence? And I keep saying that over and over again. One gentleman, one pastor put it this way. I thought it was interesting. He gives another perspective on evidence. He says, he asked people to consider a further piece of evidence. The evidence of our lives. Does your life prove that Jesus is alive? When people look at you, does the way you live verify the resurrection of Jesus? Has he changed you? Why is this question so important? Here's why. You heard people say, I believe in God, but I just can't go along with organized religion. Boy, that just... When people make statements like that, what they're saying is that they don't see enough evidence of the life of Jesus in his people to attract them to him. They believe in him, all right, but they just aren't interested in messing around trying to follow him in a relationship with his people, the church. The church has to stop giving people excuses to follow Jesus. Jesus himself calls the church to be the evidence. He gives the unbelieving world that, I love this, he gives an unbelieving world that he is alive and offers life-changing salvation. So, are we showing the world that Jesus is alive? By this, all the people will know, he said, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, John 13, 35. So the church either offers living proof of the gospel, or else it's a disgrace to the gospel. Is there evidence of Christ in your life? Would there be enough evidence to convict you as a Christian or a follower of Christ. And you know, I've, I I could play the, the advocate on the other side of it where many people will sit there and say, well, you Christians are such hypocrites. You say this and you do that. And that's true. That does happen. I, and I believe all of us stumble and fall. But the Christian who will admit that they do and ask for forgiveness, that that's the one that really is setting forth the... the the true gospel. The challenging thing that I have for people who sit there and attack other Christian brothers and sisters in Christ, they'll attack other Christians. While they're attacking other Christians, they're not living their life any better. In fact, they're probably doing the same thing or living worse. 
So again, let's take our eyes off of each other and focus on Christ so that the un the unbelieving world will see Christ living in us, moving through us, and people will be drawn to Christ. So it the evidence that Christ is in you and lives in you should be there. If it's not, you need to go to the Lord. So let, let's just go to the Lord and pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you for a simple message of the evidence of Christ living in our life. Are we living a gospel or are we living a lie? The gospel of the good news of Christ and the eternity that he will take and give us, but also the good news that we can live here on this earth today. I ask, Father, if there's anyone out there that's never asked Christ to be their Lord and Savior, let today be that day that they say, Jesus, I know that you died on the cross for my sins, that you went to the grave for three days and you were raised from the dead so that I can know you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. And if there's anyone out there that's holding a, an offense or bitterness or anything like that towards anybody, if they look up, I believe it's Matthew chapter 6, I think, uh, verse 15 or so. It's right after the Lord's Prayer. It says, if you don't forgive, the Father can't forgive you. So if there's anybody out there that's just not forgiving people for what they've done, even if it's things that they just think they have done, Lord, now convict them, allow them to forgive no matter what. Even if the other person doesn't forgive them, let them just say, I forgive them for what they've done, Lord, and help me to forgive them. And I think, I believe they will, Lord. I praise you and I thank you. Be with everybody. Be Help everybody be safe this weekend. I praise you and thank you for your word and your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great weekend in the Lord. Pastor Tim will be speaking this uh, Sunday. Like I said, it's probably around 1045 on Facebook Live. God bless and have a great evening.